See, the ileocecal valve is extremely important. Any digestive imbalance relates directly to the ileocecal valve. <clears throat> so if a person has sudden low back pain, that relates to the ileocecal valve oftentimes. The ileocecal valve is called the mimicker of all disease. It's, that's another name for it, the great mimicker, so to speak. So <clears throat> I had a patient who had pain in both big toes every time she came in to see me, and I, I kind of knew what was going on. I knew it was her ileocecal valve, but it didn't quite hit me right, you know, fully that that was exactly what was causing her toe pain. So I told her, you know, please avoid nuts, seeds, spicy food, too much alcohol, chips, caffeine, popcorn, almond butter, cow, you know, you get the idea from the, what you've already seen, to avoid those particular items that would upset her digestion. And she didn't. She kept eating these almonds because she was so convinced that seeds are good for you. So then she comes back in, and I'm getting a little frustrated seeing her marking on the chart this toe pain every time she comes in. So she comes in, and this time she brings some of the food with her. So I see that the toe pain, and I say, you know, I think that's a, you know, you have sudden, you know, sudden onset pain, inflammation and swelling on both sides, comes and goes, isn't there all the time. It was there when she came in. I said, look, you know, I think this has to do with your digestion, you know, what you're eating. Um, what are you eating? Do you, do you have any nuts, seeds, spice, food, alcohol? You know, and then I say, say these things really quickly, and she's like, well, yeah, I mean, I have some almonds. I'm like, okay, do you have any with you? And she said, yes. And I was like, great, thank you. So I, I, I treat her very effectively. We totally get rid of the toe pain, which no, d didn't seem to want to go away. Then um, there was a pain that she'd had right here, and that pain went away. The toe pain went away. There was a pain over here that went away. She had a little bit of pain on both shoulders, but it was a little bit worse on the right side. That pain went away. It's not actually the shoulder, it's called the bicep, bicipital tendon. But anyway, right, right over there, that pain went away. So all these pains subsided with the treatment. And then I had her chew and swallow a little bit of nuts, like you saw just a little while ago, and those pains came right back. And the pain here came right back. And, and the muscles that were that, I, that were weak, that relate to this ileocecal valve syndrome, that had become strong, they weakened right before her eyes. And she finally got the idea that, wow, maybe these nuts aren't so great for me. So there's a lot of misinformation about there that people are exposed to, and they think that um, a certain thing is healthy, but oftentimes it's not. I think there's no greater source uh, or profession, or I should say, there's no greater area of our society that has more information, misinformation than health and healthcare. And as we can see, healthcare in America is just not really doing very great. It's not very happy and stable, to say the least. So again, when it comes to the ileocecal valve, any time a person has a digestive imbalance or digestive trouble, they have to have trouble with their ileocecal valve. They have to. They have to. Or, or the valves of, it's called another, another area over here, it's just on the opposite side of where the ileocecal valve is. It still relates to the ileocecal valve, but just a sort of a different area on the opposite side of the body that has to do with confusion or switching, where the body is confused and it gets two sides confused. We'll get into that at some other point, not right now. So if somebody has trouble with their ileocecal valve and they have trouble with their digestion, they also have st trouble with their stomach. And 80% of digestion happens in the stomach. The stomach's very important. And the reason why that is, is because you can't break down minerals without proper stomach function. You can't make um, the enzymes and the other chemicals needed to digest your food properly without stomach, proper stomach function because you need the acid that's in the bolus of food that goes to your stomach to sort of prepare the small intestine um, with a chemical called cyclocysteine kinase, CCK, that comes from the, 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 the pancreas. You can't get that emptying of all those chemicals into the small intestine without proper stomach function. So if 80% of digestion happens in the stomach, and the stomach's really important, you can see how a lot of health concerns can arise from improper stomach function. Let's talk about that right now, really quickly. So you can't break down the minerals needed for proper thyroid health without the stomach working right, like 
the iodine, for example, is a, a major one, and tyrosine is an amino acid that's broken down from protein that's broken down in the stomach. Okay, so um, you, you can't have proper stomach health without zinc. There, it's good to know all the you know if you were a, if if a person's a healthcare provider like myself, it's good for myself and my colleagues to know these relationships when we're treating our patients. And um, without the stomach working properly, you can't break down the amino acids, which then are turned into things like neurotransmitters and bradykinins and enkephalins and endorphins. And these enkephalins, bradykinins, and endorphins, they're the names for um, chemicals which get rid of pain. They get rid of pain, okay? So very important. If you want to not have pain, you, you want to be able to have proper stomach function. Another thing is, if the stomach isn't working right, like I just said, you can't break down these amino acids, which are then turned into the neurotransmitters. And the neurotransmitters are necessary for proper concentration, they're necessary for sleeping well at night, they're necessary for proper mood. Pretty big deal, you, you see what I'm saying? So the ileocecal valve is huge. It's a really, really big thing. It may seem like not, almost nothing when you look at my little demonstration showing a little pain here, little pain there, little pain there, little pain there. But I've had people with wrist pain on both sides, on both wrists, or maybe one wrist. Nobody knows what it is. Sorry for my excitement and my you know, enthusiasm, but it just it boggles my mind that other healthcare providers haven't realized that um, myself and the other professional applied kinesiologists really do understand how these things work. And we really are able to help people by addressing the cause of something like carpal tunnel syndrome. What's the structural, chemical, emotional, electromagnetic causes of such a thing? Well, it's the ileocecal valve syndrome in 80% 80, 80 of the cases. I've had patients with that carpal tunnel syndrome, as soon as I get rid of their ileocecal valve difficulty, the carpal tunnel syndrome is gone. It's gone, vanished, doesn't come back. No need for surgery, no need for drugs, no need for painkillers, there's just no need. We deal with the cause. That's what Hippocrates said, the highest good is to find the cause of the health concern. So. I've had patients who have headaches here and there, a little bit of nausea, bloating, um, gas, constipation, diarrhea, all these types of things very often, not always, but most of the time actually, are related to trouble with this ileocecal valve. I know it sounds like I'm really getting into this ileocecal valve, which I am, but it's, it's a big deal. And if you don't address it properly, these problems tend to persist. So why would somebody feel tired all the time if they have trouble with their ileocecal valve? Well, there's a number of reasons. First of all, an active infection causes somebody to be tired. And remember, with trouble with, when there's trouble with the ileocecal valve, there's problems with diet, allergies, parasites, and emotions. And not just diet, allergies, parasites, and emotions, but when there's trouble with parasites, often people will have a fungal infection. So parasites Parasites are these little you know, creatures and they're, they're feeding off of nutrients and whatnot in your body and it's an infection, it's an active infection. When the parasite levels get too high, it causes you to get exhausted, meaning your immune system has been weakened and people, can, people have been known to die from parasites, as you know. They can be very serious. Okay? A fungal infection, similarly, when people are exhausted and they have a lot of toxicity, very often uh, they get fungal infections. Um, this is somewhat controversial in the scientific community, but when the labs are done properly to check for a fungal infection, sure enough, the fungal infections do show up. Um, although it's hard to get a, a quality lab that, that'll do so, you know, that'll really check for them. But you know, t generally people are thinking of fungal infections as candidiasis. Candida and candidiasis are slightly different things. We won't discuss that at all. But, um, you know, like uh, vaginal odor or uh, trouble with the lung, a lung infection that won't go away. Those are the most common two areas in addition to a colon um, fungal infection. So the fungus is like areas that are moist and, and, and whatnot and warm. So these fungal infections, is, infections will cause, pe they, 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 the fungus releases over 40 
different types of toxins into the bloodstream.